We'll work out how we're going to stand here at the same time. Um, so yes, I'm George. I'm an engineering manager in the growth team at Atlassian. Um, this is Leo. He's a product manager also in the growth team. Now, no matter what level of leadership you're at, you might be a CTO, you might be a team lead, you might be in different sized companies, um, you don't work in isolation. You have to form strong connections with other leaders to form an effective leadership team. Now, um, me, and, me and Leo have got combined some like 20 years experience in leadership, but for the last four years, we've worked in a leadership team at Atlassian um, that we typically call a triad. Um, in the triad team structure, there's normally three functional representatives. There's the engineering manager, that's me, I'm responsible for delivering. Um, there's the design lead, who's responsible for the user experience. And there's a product manager responsible for um, the, the customer or the business needs. But this team is responsible for delivering the magic. And the magic is delivering awesome features that our users love that are shipped on time. Now, Leo and I um, have been on both functional and dysfunctional leadership teams. Um, sometimes the dysfunctions have come from us. Usually they come from Leo here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we, we always strive to improve on our, on our trial. We try to make it better. And we can comfortably say that currently we're, we're in a very, very healthy one. So today we want to take you through what we believe are the five common dysfunctions of a leadership team uh, based on our own experiences. And I want you to ask yourself as we go through these, is my own team facing some of these problems? And if you find that you do identify with any of these, then don't worry, we're going to get you back to healthy in no time. So the first one I want to talk about is unclear expectations. So as a bit of backstory, we didn't always have this triad team structure in growth at Atlassian. Um, we started up in a very kind of startup-y, lean way in the growth team. Uh, and then sometime later, we started to bring in, uh, you know, different functions into the team and build up these triad team structures. So I remember at the time that we did that in those early days, it was a really big adjustment for us. Um, for me personally, I felt like I was going, you know, from being in control of my own destiny to being one of three voices at the table you know, each bringing the weight of their experience and their unique personalities. And I remember feeling like I was maybe going to be drowned out a little bit or I was going to start losing ownership over some key decisions and, and, you know, key responsibility areas. So, you know, what, you know, I think George might have felt a similar way at the time and what we did to compensate for this was we tried to own all of the things. It was like a big land grab, um, you know, take on more than we should. And, you know, that had its uh, negative consequences, obviously. Um, we should have instead been sort of trusting in each other and dividing and sharing those responsibilities more effectively. I remember in those early days sort of booking a meeting with a, a partner team that we worked with, only to find out later on that George had met with the exact same people uh, talking about the same things, and we were really just duplicating effort and, and, you know, really stepping on each other's toes, rather than getting out of our way. And that also made it hard for teams, hard for teams to know who to approach, you know, for, for certain things. Should I go to George? Should I go to Leo? Should I go to the design lead? They're really, you know, what it came down to was a lack of clarity around who was responsible for what. What did we expect from each other? So, you know, we did improve that over time. We built up trust between us. We clarified those expectations and we, you know, worked better as a unified team. So I want to go through a few things that you can look out for in your own leadership team to see if this is happening uh, to you. So the first uh, point is, you know, is there unclear ownership between, between you and others in your leadership team? Do you or others in your team take on more than they should, potentially? Do you find yourselves maybe dropping the ball in certain areas or not seeing things progress? And maybe you feel like you're duplicating effort or stepping on each other's toes. So if any of those uh, symptoms ring true, there's a few tips that we can give to how you can address and, and, and fix this. And the first is to run what we call this roles and responsibilities play with your leadership team to help root out the problems. So to explain what that is, first I have to talk a little bit about the Atlassian team playbook. Um, if you haven't heard of this, it's, it's a set of guides or resources that we've created and that we use almost on a daily basis to basically help you work better as a team. And we'll share some links for this at the end of the talk as well. 
But specifically, this roles and responsibilities play is really effective in helping you to clarify with the rest of your leadership team how you perceive your own role in that team and how you perceive your other uh, you know, peers uh, within that team. And probably the most important thing about it is that it brings a lot of honest conversation uh, into the room, uh, brings to light issues uh, that might otherwise kind of fester and boil over. So this is an example of one that we ran a few years back when we had a new uh, member join our triad. Um, and the key thing is that really we just spent an hour, uh, each had a page where we sort of listed out what do we think our own responsibilities are, what do we think each other's responsibilities are within the team. Then we discussed it, we came out with some notes, some actions to take away, and a record of that whole conversation that we could sort of refer back to uh, if there was ever, ever any sort of lack of clarity there. And we found that doing this for one hour, just one hour early on, as we're sort of trying to come together as a team, saved us countless hours down the track of dealing with those consequences of unclear expectations with your peers. The second point is to check your ego at the door. So once you know what you and the rest of your uh, leadership team is responsible for, uh, learn to trust them to do a great job. Um, let them be awesome, and then you give yourself the time and space to focus on your own strengths and what you bring to the table personally. And the final point I want to uh, leave, leave you with is to learn to let go of things. You don't need to own everything, as we obviously uh, learned in those early days. Um, it is important you know, to still give your opinion when you feel strongly about things, even if it's not within your domain. So I can still give my opinion on user experience issues. Um, but as this wise uh, man once said a couple of years back in the Amazon shareholder letter, uh, he uses the term disagree and commit. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, but really it's about, you know, don't drag out decisions that aren't really in your wheelhouse. You know, you can give your opinion, but trust that if it's in your team member's uh, domain, they're best equipped to make the final call. So you can disagree and commit to a course of action. Great. So the, the next dysfunction we're going to talk about is unbalanced team. Um, the reason for a leadership team is that we can take um, a balanced view on every single project that we work with. Um, as I said, um, the typical structure for that Atlassian is a PM to represent the business, a designer to represent the user, um, and an engineering manager to make sure that we can actually build the thing that we want to build. But leadership teams come in in many different shapes and sizes. I think everybody here will have a, a different, different shape and size to that. Um, and even Atlassian in the triad structure, sometimes we won't have a designer in the triad. Sometimes one person takes on the responsibility of both the team lead um, and the product manager. Um, but Whatever shape your leadership team is in, the important thing is to make the number of stakeholders low so we can make fast and effective decisions. Now, we were working on a project a couple of years ago um, where we were working with another team um, to, to deliver a feature together. And to do this, um, we decided to form a SWAT team. And in this SWAT team, we have engineers from both teams. So we're working together, we're gonna, it's going to go well. So in this SWAT team, um, we had um, formed kind of an uber triad. And in this triad, we had uh, two design leads, we had two engineering managers, one from each team, and Leo as a product manager. Um, as you can imagine, as soon as we actually started kicking off the project, we started butting heads with each other. The, the design leads and the engineering managers had different ideas about how we should address problems and how we should approach decisions. Um, also, Leo's voice as a product manager had become devalued and he was less influential in the triad because there are more voices in the room. But worse still, the engineers themselves didn't know who to turn to for help because they didn't know who was responsible for what. Now, we had a pretty simple fix for this. We basically took that project, we split it into two streams, and each of those streams had one design lead, one engineering manager, and then the product manager um, was across both. Um, now the engineers knew who to turn to for help, who was responsible for the project, um, and effectively we'd formed two healthy triads. And obviously this is a really, really um, extreme example of, of an unbalanced team. Um, but an unbalanced team can come from different places. It come, can come from different levels of motivation, um, different levels of maturity. Um, it can come from um, more and more years of experience in, in leadership, um, or it can actually come from just underperforming leaders. So how can you tell that your leadership team is unbalanced? Um, one thing to look out is for whether you're getting constant conflict between the leaders in your leadership team. 
whether you're finding it hard to come to a consensus on decisions together, or maybe you're actually constantly unhappy with the decisions that your leadership team is making. So how can we breathe health into an unbalanced team? Um, the first is, is to kind of try and rebalance. So look around your leadership team and see what are their strengths and, and what are their weaknesses, and then readjust responsibilities to match. And we can share goals. So if you're working with another, another team, um, don't, don't try and share responsibilities amongst your leaders like we did. Um, we, we use something at Atlassian called the OKR framework. Um, some of you may be using it, um, but whatever you're using, you're setting some kind of goals in your teams. And, and, and what you should do when you're working with another team is set shared goals between those teams. Because if you have the same goals, you're going to have the same targets. And then your two teams, are they going to go into naturally work organically together to reach the same targets? And the last fix I'll talk about is health monitors. So what you can do is you can run a leadership health monitor for your team. Now, the leadership health monitor tries to look at eight common attributes uh, seen amongst very healthy, high-performing leadership teams, and it targets questions at these attributes to see how you're performing with them. These attributes, as you can see, they're things like, are you balanced, our subject at the moment, or do you have a shared understanding? How are you measuring your outcomes? It asks your leadership team questions about how you're approaching each of these topics so you can identify where you may be falling a little bit short and you can form kind of targeted time box actions to try and improve in these areas. Now, this is the second play we've shown you, um, so it's probably not too much of a spoiler to say there's going to be a couple more. Um, I think the important thing to say is these plays help you identify potential problems in your leadership team. Don't think they're going to magically fix all of your problems. It's up to you as a leadership team to look at these and form actions to improve on yourself. So the next um, dysfunction is unproductive conflict. Um, so the wider team is looking to the leadership team for that direction, passion, and the positive approach to you know, achieving the team's goal and mission. Um, what they don't want to see is leaders who are constantly in conflict who maybe lack that belief or that drive to achieve uh, that mission. Um, so George and I have worked in, in triads before. We've had uh, members who are you know, a little bit disengaged uh, or not really bought into what the team was trying to achieve. And one in particular that I want to highlight uh, was a really uh, a bit more of a concerning situation. Um, so as a bit of backstory, in growth, we work with a lot of uh, product teams. So we don't own a specific product ourselves, but we work directly and closely with the uh, product teams to improve customer experiences and directly drive business outcomes. Now, this person that we worked with in a triad uh, quite a few years back uh, wasn't really bought in that growth was the right team to be hidden the goals that we'd set for ourselves. So they really thought it was something that was more in the product team's wheelhouse. Now, the way that they expressed this was, you know, whenever we were in a team meeting with the rest of the team, you know, it would come out as you know, undermining what we were trying to achieve, taking on a really negative tone in front of everyone, um, sort of giving different directions to what we were you know, trying to do. Um, and so really, we were starting to butt heads uh, frequently within the leadership team. We, we couldn't fundamentally, you know, we couldn't agree on, on the fundamentals. Now, I just want to point out that the, the heart of the triad model is actually productive conflict. Um, so the point is, you know, each um, discipline or, or function brings in their expertise, and you have these robust discussions. But at the end of that, you come out with, hopefully, better decisions and better outcomes as a result. Here, we were seeing that the conflict wasn't really very productive. It was taking on a negative tone, and it, it, there was no resolution. So we had to do something about it. So George and I spent a lot of time and effort trying to resolve the situation. We you know, first took the person out for coffee and, and tried to understand where they were coming from. You know? um, we tried to get to you know, the root of the dissatisfaction. We also gave direct constructive feedback, um, but unfortunately the situation continued. So the way that it ended is you know, we had to speak to their manager to say, hey, you know, we don't think that there's alignment here, and the manager was able to sort of look in other areas and find them a team that was better suited to their passion. Um, and then that helped us get alignment back into our own leadership team. So a few things that you can look out for in your leadership team, uh, first of all, that negative conflict, are you seeing that within the team where there's often no resolution or maybe it takes on that really negative tone? 
Maybe you find that you are kind of covering for others. So um, what happened with us is as that was sort of bleeding out into the wider team, they started noticing that negativity. We had to shelter them, try to shelter them from, from, from that behavior. Or maybe you feel like you're not really presenting a united front as a leadership team. You know, are you, you know, do you find that there's peers that are frequently questioning the team's goals or mission? Um, or you know, are you presenting that united front to the wider team or to your own leaders? So a few things you can try uh, to, to help with this problem. So the first is to really invest more time up front in building stronger alignment within your leadership team, uh, especially around your team's mission and the goals that you set. So making sure that you involve everyone from the beginning um, and seek input regularly to ensure that everybody is bought in. At Alassian, we have um, quarterly and yearly planning cycles. And as George mentioned, we use OKRs as part of that as well. But it's really critical that all leaders are involved in this process. It's not just the PM's responsibility. Um, maybe one person can drive it, but all leaders should be collaborating on this and really um, you know, being aligned on, on what, the team's goals, uh, what the team's goals are. The second point is don't be shy to give constructive feedback to your fellow leaders. Um, let them know if, you're, you know if they're bringing that undue negativity or that unproductive conflict into the team. Um, approach that with some sensitivity and that seek first to understand attitude. Um, but it's important that you do address these behaviours when they happen and don't wait for maybe that yearly peer review cycle to give the feedback. Um, and I actually wanted to give a call out as, as well to, I think Mike, you mentioned the Radical Candor framework. It's one that we use uh, quite a lot at, at Atlassian. We find really, really uh, useful in, in these kind of situations. So um, I can second that one. And the final point is, you know, don't be afraid to escalate if all other avenues have been exhausted. So it's not just about one person's feelings, it's really the whole team is at stake here. They're dependent on their leaders to be rock solid. All right, the fourth dysfunction I'm going to talk about is ineffective communication. Now, Atlassian's grown really, really quickly over the last few years. If I look back four years, we had, I think it was 1,000 engineers. Um, we now have 5,000 people at Atlassian. So there's now a lot of teams doing a lot of stuff. And as leaders, we need to be across what all of that stuff is, and we need to make sure that our team is aligned to it, which, which is very, 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 very hard. So who's, <laughs> so whose responsibility is this? Well, it's generally thought that it's the product manager's responsibility. Yeah, that's their job, that's all they do. <laughs> so how does this pan out in reality? Well, we worked on a, product last year, on a project last year um, where we were making some changes to a feature in another product team's code base. So Leo reached out, reached out to their product manager. Um, he told them what we wanted to do, he got alignment, they said, it's okay, you can do it. He came back to me, he said, we're good to go. So my engineering team came in, they wrote a lot of code, and after a month or so, they started raising PRs into that, into that team's code base. And then we had carnage. Yeah, their, their engineers had no idea at all of what we were doing, because their product manager hadn't told their engineering manager what he'd agreed with Leo. So what about if it's the other way around? Maybe it's the engineering manager's responsibility. So on another project that we worked on, it was mainly technical, mainly back-end changes. We weren't changing features, so it made sense for me to reach out to the engineering manager, align on what we're going to do, get them to say, yes, you're good. We made the changes, and they went. And then the next quarter, that feature disappeared completely. <laughs> so same thing, their engineering manager hadn't told his product manager what we'd agreed with him, and that product manager could have told him that they were going to remove this feature up front. So again, a lot of wasted work. So you know where I'm going with it. It's obvious. It's obviously all of our responsibility in the leadership team to align with the other leaders. So how can you detect this in your leadership team? Well, there's a few things to look out for. One is, do you find that in your team, you're constantly changing up on your requirements based on changes to other teams' roadmaps? Do you find that you're hearing from your engineers that they're constantly pivoting on what they're doing because of changes to other teams' architecture? And probably the worst of all, do you find that your relationship with other teams is continually breaking down? 
So again, we have three fixes for this. Um, the first is to identify your dependencies. It's really important that everybody in your leadership team knows who their counterpart is in the teams that you work with. Now, for this, we use what we call a risks and dependencies board. As you can see on the right-hand side here, we've listed out all the teams that we work with in our team. And as we drill into these, we can see who the leaders are for that team. Then every week in our leadership team, in our triad team meeting, we, um, we, go, we just take one or two minutes at the beginning to run through these teams and go through and, and share what conversations we've had with these leaders and the other teams. And this is a great way to find out what risks may be upcoming from external teams and an action and mitigation plan. Formalize agreements. Often we make ad hoc agreements inside meetings with other teams. Um, but these ad hoc agreements are often able to be misunderstood by other teams, um, or maybe people don't really know that they're totally bought into doing something that they've agreed to. So what we encourage you to do is formalize these agreements, because by making sure that other teams have actually formally committed to taking on actions that you've brought up during these meetings, um, A, you can make sure they understand what that commitment is, and B, you know that they're going to do it. Now, at Atlassian, um, even though we've grown a lot, we're still trying to maintain that startup culture. So having something like this seems quite onerous, and um, some people call it a bit corporate. Um, but informal conversations are just that, and, and nothing says accepted like a tick. And, and the last fix I'll talk about is regular one-on-ones. So um, I think we already heard today about having regular one-on-ones is really important as, as a people manager. Um, but it's also really important for, for leaders to be having regular one-on-ones with their counterparts in other teams. So make sure that everyone on your, on your leadership team is, is having those one-on-ones. And at the beginning of projects, we actually make sure we have a whole triad on triad one-on-one -on -one to make sure that we're all aligned to the full project we're about to work on. All right, so the final dysfunction is withholding information. <clears throat> so uh, some time ago, our team was tasked with a new project. Um, it didn't really fit within the goals that we'd set for ourselves. Uh, we didn't really know whether we'd get a lot of investment to continue working on this long term. So as product manager, I decided the best thing I could do for my team was to shield them from this project until we had a bit more certainty. Um, now, in practice, what that meant was I actually started withholding information from the rest of my triad. Um, I made decisions without consulting them, making you know, technical assumptions without you know, speaking to George first. And that all came to a head when I went on holidays for a week, and I said, hey, George, can you look after this project for me? And he came in cold. He didn't have the context. He said, why did you make this decision like this? You know, it could have been done a lot better had I been involved from the get-go. Um, so lesson learned, I came back. We, we kind of sorted it out. We got the team involved um, and, and brought that on, on track. Um, but you know, I've been on the receiving end of that as well, where other members of the leadership team have been withholding information from, from, from me. Um, and usually that's with good intentions. Maybe you think, oh, the whole team doesn't need to know about this yet, or I don't want to disrupt them from whatever they're working on. Um, the problem is if that becomes a pattern of behavior, um, you, know, you, you can find that you, you know, you're not really making the best possible decisions by you know, bringing in all the relevant people uh, from the get-go. Um, and really you want to be sparring with the rest of your leadership team and getting their perspective when it's, when it's relevant to. Um, and the other thing that can happen then is that you know, the team has to end up pivoting work to make up for those poorer decisions, which costs time and, and effort. Um, and you're sort of undermining each other by assuming things uh, rather than just bringing the right people in. So um, a few things to look out for with this is just, do you feel like there's a, a lack of communication within the leadership team? You're only sort of seeing each other during those sort of you know, monthly or fortnightly meetings or something like that. Do you feel like you're actually working together well as a team, or you're just sort of operating as individuals, you know, a bunch of people working alongside each other? And finally, do you feel like the team is, you know, frequently pivoting or reacting to changes as, you know, you're sort of making and revising decisions, or different leaders are giving different directions? So a few things that you can do to, to help fix this. So the first is um, something that we try to do uh, is religiously sort of document almost every decision that we make uh, within our team. Um, and that really helps you to, to think about, OK, what's the decision we're trying to make? Who should be involved? Um, and bring in all the relevant stakeholders from the get-go. Who's heard of the DACI framework for decision making? It's a few. OK. So DACI stands for driver, approver, contributors, and informed. And 
We use this framework quite extensively at Atlassian with decisions. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be for all decisions, but it really, really helps, especially with uh, the more complex ones where you need to bring in external stakeholders, uh, or maybe it's a one-way door type decision. And what it looks like is, is something like this, is one that we did uh, not long ago, and it, you can see that it really brings some structure to your decisions. You spell out who's, you know, who are all the people impacted? Who's the person making the final call? What's all the background and data needed to make the best possible decision? And what are all of the options on the table with pros and cons listed? It seems onerous to put this together, but it really helps you know, drive discussions and clarify uh, for everybody uh, what you're trying to get decided. Now, no matter what type of decision framework you use, once you've documented a decision, what, what we do is we bubble all of those up to a decision register. Um, so this can happen automatically, and, and for us, this is a living document that we're constantly referring to within our triad to look at what are the decisions that are currently open, how can we prioritize these so we know which one we should be focusing on to keep the project on track. And really, this gives us a really good visibility. So even if we're not talking about a decision, at any point, we can look at this page and see what's going on. So there's really no secrets between us. The second point maybe seems more obvious, but just keeping those open communication channels. If you happen to work in the same office space, sit physically close to each other, you know, chat to each you know, it, that just encourages that open communication. Um, if you can't, you know, if you're not in the same office, um, just over-communicate via those remote channels, Slack, email, video conference, um, to keep those open communication channels, as I said. And the final point is that informal sparring, you know, taking the time to spar ideas, decisions, solutions with each other, go to a whiteboard, you know, draw something out. Um, all of that stuff really helps uh, to keep you on the same page. All right, so those are our five common dysfunctions. Um, but we'd like to finish this talk on a more positive note by taking you through what a healthy leadership team looks like. Um, so first of all, everyone in your leadership team trusts each other um, implicitly. And this, this can take a bit of a while to build. So even if you've crushed it in other leadership teams, um, coming into, if you've got a new person coming into your leadership team or you're going to a new one, um, it can take a long time to build it again. Um, one of the tactics that we use um, when we bring new people in, not just to the leadership team, but also to our general teams, is to run a personality test. Um, everyone in your team um, is different. Yeah, and a, and, a, and a personality test will help you identify the different characteristics of the people in your team, especially your leaders. Are, are they the kind of people who like to be interrupted at their desk when something happens, or do they prefer to have a meeting set with a clear agenda? Um, are they the kind of people who, if an issue happens, they want to hear about it word of mouth, um, straight up to their face, or would they rather have it documented on a page so they can understand it asynchronously? Just by changing those little behaviors of how you interact with your other leaders is going to really ramp up the speed that you can build up that trust. Everyone in your leadership team should be really, really clear on what they are and what they are not responsible for. Um, as Leo said earlier, you can use the roles and responsibilities play to get you there. Um, and everyone should be coming to the leadership team with a really positive attitude and taking this positivity and bringing that to your team so they see you being positive leaders. Um, so if you find yourself conflicting on how you should approach decisions or the outcome of decisions, um, approach each of the opinions of your, of your leaders with a can-do attitude. Like seek first to understand where they're coming from. And if something isn't quite there yet, then use kind of a yes and approach to find out what it will take to get it there. Um, if you really can't come to a clear decision, you still do need to make a decision. So um, disagree and then commit and then bring a united front to the rest of your team. And, and the last, last um, characteristic of a healthy team is a growth mindset. As leaders, we all need to be continually iterating and improve on how we lead our teams. Um, how do we do this? Well, every agile team is running a retro, probably at the end of their sprints. Um, we should be doing the same as leaders. Regularly have a retro for your other leaders where you identify what your strengths and your weaknesses are and where you can improve. So those are our common five dysfunctions of a leadership team, and I've also taken you through what a healthy one looks like. If you'd like to learn any more about this or find out more about the plays that we've spoken about, then you can read about them at the Atlassian Team Playbook. Thank you. Thanks.